I'm Heather. And I'm Mike. And this is Let's Talk Outdoors. Today we're chatting with Ashlyn George. Ashlyn is the face behind the Lost Girls Guide on Instagram and is also a former Saskatchewan wanderer. We met with Ashlyn over Zoom while she was at home in Saskatoon. Join us as we chat about Ashlyn's world travels, what brought her back to Saskatchewan, and what she recommends doing outdoors this winter. Hi, Ashlyn. It looks like you're muted. <laughs> there we go. It's like the classic <laughs> beginning to any. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Thanks for taking some time out of your uh, your busy, busy life of moving around. So glad we could catch you. Oh, of course. I think this is awesome. I'm super excited. So, and actually, we're all technically teachers here because I actually yes. have my education degree as well. I just never <laughs> stepped into like a classroom. The only job interview That's I ever awesome. did was was actually for like an outdoor school program. And then I didn't get the job, which is an okay thing with me. So. Actually, right before you came on, Ashlyn, Heather and I were just bringing that up. I'm like, and Heather was like, yeah, I'm glad that she decided to do what she did because we would be out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, they didn't pick me for the job anyway. So, <laughs> which is fine. I went to Australia and New Zealand and Fiji right. for six months. So I was happy. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay, you have given us a lot of talking points, actually. Would you mind t- introducing yourself to our listeners? Uh, tell us about yourself and maybe some of your experiences that have led you to where you are now. Yeah, so my name is Ashlyn George, and I guess most people know me from blogging at the Lost Girls Guide to Finding the World. Um, I was also a former Saskatchewan for anybody listening in Saskatchewan. And essentially what I do is I write about and document my travels, and I share it digitally online. And thankfully, I've been able to turn that into a full-time business. That's not the only thing I do, but that's part of it. And yeah, so I'm just personally very passionate about outdoor adventures. I spent five years um, traveling the world solo, which I think has kind of led me into where I am today and really hard, like honing in on my passion for the outdoors and getting outside and getting into nature and experiencing destinations through nature as well. So how old or how long ago, I should say, sorry, I won't ask your age, but how long ago were you the Saskatchewan wanderer? I so I held that role in 2015, so about five years ago now. Yeah, okay, right on. And was that when you were fresh out of university? Not quite. No, actually. So I went to university to become a high school biology teacher. Um, I also have an English degree as well. So I think that perfectly blends my passion for the outdoors and then obviously writing and sharing those adventures. Um, And then I had this job interview fall into my lap for like an outdoor, like kind of eco justice program in Saskatoon. And I went to the interview and it was one where you get to wear yoga pants and wear a ponytail to the interview (laughs) because you want to look the part. Um, And I walked away and the interview went fine but I walked away thinking oh boy I don't think I actually want that job and thankfully I didn't get it kind of the one time you go for a job (laughs) you don't get it and you're okay with that um because at the time I was actually planning to do a little bit of traveling I I have this bucket list and I wanted to chase the sun for a year and obviously we have long winters in Saskatchewan so I wanted to travel from about October until April or May and so I didn't get the job so I didn't have to worry about you know deciding between do I travel do I you know work as a teacher and that kind of is the lead up to where I got to today so um, I spent my philosophy was if I could spend five years learning in an institution in university I could spend five years learning in the world. So I very carefully budgeted my way through traveling around the world for six months of the year, year, every year for five years. Um, So I did that through 2010 to, I guess, 2015. And I launched my blog, The Lost Girls Guide to Finding the World in late 2013, just because people were asking me so many questions about travel and solo travel. And I know 2010 is a decade ago, but it's still like not that long ago, (laughs) but travel was very different at the time. There were no smartphones. You didn't have a lot of Wi-Fi access. So I was still traveling with a guidebook, you know, so there were lots of questions about it. So that led me to starting my blog. And then 
um, during my fifth and final year of traveling the world, um, the job application came up for the Shast Wanderer position. I was in Madagascar at the time. I used my location as a quirky thing to include in my video when I applied. Um, but of course, like reference that I'm from Saskatchewan, I'm a farm girl here, and um, they wanted to do an interview. So I think I, I found, I was in Swaziland in the time that they wanted to do the interview. I'd come back from Madagascar to mainland Africa, and I rented a conference room in like the only like fancy hotel that I could find in Swaziland because I needed good internet access and I was testing internet everywhere and I couldn't find it and I didn't want to do the interview in an internet cafe which is what they have there so yeah so I interviewed in Swaziland and it was like a bit of a hot mess of an interview I didn't have internet in time and the audio didn't work so they were calling like my South African phone number in Swaziland but my phone was in airplane mode that's a very long story but um in 2015 I came came back to Saskatchewan and took that role on for a year I appreciate it like what you managed to do glo like obviously locally but globally mm -hmm. during a time where like my wife and I think back to it all the time like how did we travel before like Google Maps and like all these really great online reviews. It was like, yeah, you had a little map and you had like a notebook of that country being like, yeah, you can try here. But it's like, you know, that's, yeah. that's it's different to navigate like what you did of just choosing a country, having a few things you wanted to go on, but then like going around the whole place and just just kind of trust in your gut and being like, yeah, this is where I feel like I should be going. And yeah, yeah it's neat. And Mm -hmm. And making a five year plan. Like I've heard of people saying, I'll go for one year, but your plan was for five years. That is incredible. I think my dad thought I was a little bit crazy <laughs> to start. Yeah. But then he saw that like, I wasn't just like partying my money and my time away that there was like real intention and purpose behind it. And then it was cool because my parents got to visit me like I've been to six continents with my mom, because they've been able wow. to visit me everywhere too. And I've been able to show them like, here's the rest of the world. Here's agriculture in other countries. And so those have been really powerful moments too, is when you get to see somebody who's really out of their element experience mm -hmm. some of those things too. Yeah. But yeah, you're so right, though. Like, I, I actually have a stack on my bookshelf of all the Lonely Planet guidebooks, and I would yeah. carry one with me to every country I would go to because it would give you a general outline of like I knew I could bus in somewhere at four in the morning and be able to walk to a hostel and like sometimes I slept outside the hostel before like it opened <laughs> and like then you could check in at seven in the morning. Um, but yeah, I think that's it comes back to that fear thing too is like the scariest part is just deciding to go and then you get there and you realize you just have to bite it off in small chunks and figure it out as you go too i know you were born in saskatchewan but did you have like how how was that were you excited then to go from like africa to doing saskatchewan based i'm not saying like i obviously we love saskatchewan but it's pretty different like a pretty different experience being outdoors there and then here was that something you were pretty excited to get back and do were you ready for that transition out of traveling the world it was really nice timing actually so i'm very plan based i'm kind of a type a personality and and i had this five-year plan and that was the goal i was working on and it was coming to an end and that's kind of the name of my brand the lost girl's guide to finding the world not just that i lose things all around the world but <laughs> I didn't necessarily know what I wanted to do or where I wanted to take my career and that five years was coming to an end. I didn't know what I was going to do when I came back to Saskatchewan and came back to work in the summer because I worked a seasonal job. And so this was kind of that perfect answer that still let me travel, but paid me to travel and create content and do more writing. So it was kind of this perfect thing at the right time. And through travel, I become so appreciative of any destination I'm in. They're all so different, but so amazing in their own way. And so it was really cool to come home and have that global perspective and bring it back here and really shine light on some things that were like, oh, well, that's normal here. But lots of people don't see the northern light or don't see snow or don't see the stars. So it was a cool opportunity to profile that as well. Like you would leave for six months and then come back and work a seasonal job and say, I'm only here for six months. It was so it was a summer job. And I actually it's funny that I love winter so much now because I spent five years missing winter. Maybe that's why. Um, and then I, of course, I had student loans from five years of university. And um, I, I also joke that, like, I shouldn't be a travel writer. I should be a finance writer because I'm so hardcore and passionate about budgeting and finances. 
and I love spreadsheets. Um, but I would budget every single penny. I would coupon, I bike to work every day. I only allowed myself one tank of fuel a month. So I had to like, if I had to go to the farm, that's nearly a tank of gas. So what am I going to do the rest of the month? So walking, running, biking, just being smart about running errands. Yeah, I would save money every single way I could. And I had to have my payments for my student loans saved up before I could ever book a trip. So I knew that there was money to pay the student loans for the six months I was gone. And then I knew I'd come home to a job where I could earn again for six months and then allocate that money as I needed to. Very passionate about saving and budgeting. So then as passionate as you were about saving and budgeting while you were home in Saskatoon, I'll call Saskatoon home. uh, Did you budget the same way while you were abroad? Or did you think, you know what, this is what I was working for, I'm going to spend it all? It was a balance of both. So I actually, at this point in time, I had an iPod and there was an app called I Expense It. Now, when you're traveling abroad, you don't always get to use your credit card everywhere or it actually costs you more because you have to pay like a 5% surcharge. So I would take cash out of an ATM, but then in this app, I would track every single thing I spent every day in this app. I would manually input it and be like ice cream, $1.50 and put it in the app. So I can, if I went through, I could tell you how much I've spent on ice cream in like 60 different countries, albeit in different currencies. Um, So I would track it every country and see how much I'd spent per country then compared the different costs. And so like that was just a really important part for me, but it wasn't like I was traveling and not willing to spend money. I would invest in opportunities and activities that I couldn't get at home. So like there was a week in New Zealand that was kind of insane. And I went skydiving and bungee jumping and a jet boat ride and a helicopter ride all in the same day. And then the next day was whitewater rafting. And then I went like caving and blackwater rafting and abseiling. And I got shot out of like this slingshot thing. And I went zorbing in that plastic ball down a hill. And I did the longest hike I had ever done in my entire life, the Tongariro Alpine Crossing. It was a day hike, 21 kilometers. You climb Mount Doom from the Lord of the Rings. And I did all of these things in like five or six days. And I also managed to save and budget with that too, because um, by doing the skydive, the bungee jump, the jet boat ride, and the helicopter ride all in one day, they bundled it so it didn't cost that much. And then I actually found, when I was in Australia, I found a $50 off coupon for this activity Uh in New Zealand. And then I had the bonus of the Canadian dollar was stronger than the New Zealand dollar at the time. So it was like an additional 25% off. So I think all four of those activities ended up being like, $300 or something. Plus I got a photo (laughs) from each one of them. (laughs) It was just being really careful and savvy about how I spent my money and what I was going to invest it in, but also being open to those opportunities. You basically did season one of the amazing race for 300 bucks. (laughs) Pretty much. (laughs) Bungee jumping was scary. I don't actually like heights, but I will do it a second time just to be like, no, I can't do it. one time wasn't enough. So for those full five years, um, did you have an overlap in your travel companions or did you do it all solo? It was all, I went out on every trip solo. um, But that being said, like you meet amazing people around the world everywhere. And sometimes you cross paths with somebody for an afternoon. And then there were times where I would travel for a couple weeks with somebody. Or when I was in Southeast Asia, I had a guy from Calgary and we ended up spending most of the six months together. So every trip was different. And it was, I think that was half the fun is showing up, being able to change schedule at a whim based on who you met and where everybody wanted to go. So it was pretty cool. And I remember reading in one of your articles um, that you talk about the fear of leaving on one of your long term trips. Um, what, What did you mean by that? Even no matter how much I travel, it still scares me. And I think because there's that element of the unknown to it, it's a it's a scary thing to walk into a new country, a new culture, new food, new currency, new language, new norms, new, new like just getting comfortable with a new culture, right? And it's scary to do that as a solo woman every time, no matter how much I've traveled. And there's always a learning curve that you have to figure out. And no matter no matter how many trips I go on, there's always a fear the night before of how challenging it might be or some of the shenanigans I might find myself in because, oh, do they happen? It's really interesting to me, like you saw anything and everything in the five years of 
like other country travel and yet you're still back home and it all brought you back home to Saskatchewan, right? You became the Saskatchewan Wanderer. Uh, you've been doing a lot of traveling just recently around Saskatchewan. And I guess, um, do you have any, any Saskatchewan bucket list items that even in all of your travel that you ha like haven't been there yet or you really want to do that one thing? For me, I've, I've only tried skate skiing a couple times and I actually this summer bought a new to me set of skate skis. And so I have classic and now I have skate skis. So that's gonna be like my winter challenge to myself. It's also a really good workout, which is what I'm excited about. So I'm gonna see what I can do for skate skiing. Um, and just, I think I'd like to do some more winter camping. I was building Quincy's last year and I don't actually think I got out tenting in the snow so I, I feel like this year is a year to go back out and do that there was one year it was like I went winter camping six weekends in a row or something crazy like that um but yeah I just think for to encourage people to rent a pair of snowshoes or take a lesson for cross-country skiing so they have a little bit of knowledge before they head out there and just try something new or different that they haven't done before even even something as simple as like making a hot chocolate char charcuterie board and having a hot dog roaster on a fire one afternoon right like make it cute make it cozy make it fun and like go have a hot dog roast and make s'mores and drink hot chocolate and like that's an amazing adventure too actually I usually make a seasonal bucket list of places to get to um so I have this little book it's like a daily journal and in the back of it is my Saskatchewan it was the summer bucket list but now I guess I have a winter one um so there's always places I'm learning about and hearing about and I managed to go to most of them this summer it grew from I think 5 to 15. um one place I haven't yet been is like the Massel Clay Canyons in the Avonlea Badlands it's kind of I believe it's like southwest of Regina a little ways. Um, so I haven't been out there and I've been saving up, you know, a specific trip to head out there and check that out. And there's just, the more you learn about a place, the more you realize there is to see and do. And so that's even one thing, when you go somewhere new for the first time, you usually tick off those big ticket items, right? When you go to Paris, you go see the Eiffel Tower and it's awesome. And I hate when people talk about tourist traps because I'm like, no, like you gotta go see those and have that experience too. But the more time you spend in a location, um, the more time you can actually get to know it on a deeper level too. And that's just what I've done with Saskatchewan because I'm based out of here and because I just have a natural love for adventuring. When I'm at home, I'm looking for local adventures. So there's tons to do here, which is really exciting. Do you ever come at the end of like uh, completing one of your li bucket lists that you have and then being like, yeah, I think I'm okay for a bit to not do anything. Or do you just kind of feel like, no, I'm going to get, I'm going to make another bucket list because, yeah, I can imagine that that'd be like almost exhausting. Being exhausting, like, right, absolutely. And then what's next? They do just kind of blend into one another and never ends because it's like the list just gets longer. The more you see and do, the more you learn about. Um, like on a real note, like I do have a lot of energy, but I do get really tired and things burn me out. I'm very extroverted, but in the last few years, I've found myself being more of a homebody, even though people probably wouldn't <laughs> wouldn't expect that. When I'm home in Saskatoon, I just wanna I wanna hang around my house. I wanna like organize my stuff at home. I might just sit and watch Netflix because I just need downtime too. And I'm also, I always talk about stacking opportunities. So even this summer I was in Carrot River for a work trip, but then I was near Nipawin and there was a restaurant I wanted to go to. And then I actually, there was a cabin I wanted to check out, but then I wasn't too far off going to Good Spirit and then popping up to Duck Mountain and then coming back and stopping at my parents' farm and then coming back to Saskatoon. So all of a sudden, like a three-day work trip has now turned into a 10-day trip. But I can also always sell a story off of the other activities I'm doing and create content and sell that content. So there's always work in the back of my mind as well. So it's like, I haven't figured out the balance and you would never know this by just looking at my content online, but like I do get tired and I do get exhausted and I don't sleep much either because I'm usually up till 4 a.m. the night before a trip trying to wrap the last thing, <laughs> but right. it's crazy. Yeah. yeah, but I do love it, right? Like I wouldn't still be doing it years mm -hmm. later if I didn't love it. And when it gets to be too much, I will just transition into something, something different. That's right. really cool.
Yeah, you've transitioned from 2010 technology to 2020 technology. Always a work in progress. (laughs) (laughs) Speaking of being back here, do you have like a favorite winter experience that you've you've got to go through in Saskatchewan? Oh, there are so many things that I love about winter. I think the top thing is that you can slide and glide places. (laughs) It's like the easiest way to get around. You can go skating and sledding and tobogganing and cross-country skiing. Um, So I really love that aspect of it. But I've really loved kind of getting into winter camping and building Quincy's because it's challenging and it can push your limits. And you have to be prepared and you have to be smart about it too. And I just love that it's, it's something a lot of people think is crazy, but I I disagree. Like if you have a good bonfire going and you have ski pants and winter boots, you'll probably be okay. It's not that bad. And so I love challenging people's perceptions of cold and what winter is like and saying, hey, it's actually pretty cool. So yeah, winter camping has been a really fun thing to kind of get into. Yeah, I find it's like a big mental like if I know I'm going to go out somewhere cold for a while, it's got to be, like I, I psych myself up for like, you know, a few hours ahead of time. Like, yeah, you can do this or in like the day before. But. And I was just going to ask Ashlyn, like where you've um, been winter camping and whether you sleep in a hot tent or a regular tent, or if you always build a Quincy and sleep in a Quincy. Uh, so it varies. Um, I don't have a hot tent. I've actually never camped in one before. I have a friend who has one and I actually had a company reach out to offer me one but I just don't know if I would use it enough to take up that offer. Um, So what I traditionally do, I just have a three season tent and I just sleep in that overnight. (laughs) Um, So it's, it's not, you know, it's not even a four season tent, but I have a really good sleeping bag. Um, It's rated to, I think minus minus 26, which is pretty decent, but yeah, I like to just do a bunch of different things. So I've like cross country skied in, in Prince Albert national park and camped out at cream camp kitchen before I didn't even realize there was a camp kitchen out there until we arrived but we still slept in the tent um i've built quincy's a couple times and then i've done a lot more i guess like car front country winter camping because then you have the vehicle and you can have a couple extra blankets and stuff if you want Mm -hmm. so so um like i have slept in i'm sorry i'm just thinking back i have helped build dozens of quincy's (laughs) mainly because uh our we separate our students to groups for each winter camp and they they build a Quincy like one for every three or four of them so I'm usually the one walking around and helping them build Quincy's and then I have built my own and slept in my own only once and uh, yeah so like I have a little bit of experience with sleeping in them lots of experience with building them uh, Mike I don't know where you're at oh I, yeah it's been a while it's been a, it, like I was actually yeah I was reading Ashlyn's write-up about like how to build a good Quincy I'm like you know I wish I would have read that from when <laughs> I was a youngster because <laughs> my experience was like yeah it wasn't as positive I was super warm but it like it just wasn't a great build you know and right. that speaks to my that speaks to my skills of building things so yeah. yeah so if we could push people to read to read your blog post about building Quincy's first of all and we'll be posting that link with the uh, with this episode but what recommendations do you have for people once their Quincy is built for sleeping in the Quincy do you have any, any tips and tricks so I think I would have two tips um the first one is actually in terms of the gear that you're wearing so when you're building the Quincy you're getting really hot and sweaty you're moving around um and so I strongly recommend to people that when you are done building the Quincy and you know you're done building it change absolutely every item of clothing that you're wearing. And I I include underwear and sports bra with that because you're sweating and they get wet, usually the first. Um, So it's cold to take your clothes off, but it's worth it. So I recommend changing out and putting on a fresh set of base layers because then while you're sitting around waiting for the Quincy to settle or when you're getting ready to climb into the Quincy for night, you're completely dry and you're not chilled. And then you, it's once you get chilled, it's actually it can be difficult to warm yourself up. And I'm, I'm actually quite a cold person. I get cold really fast. And I, I don't know, it's funny that I love winter so much when I'm always cold. Um, so I strongly recommend that making sure you have the appropriate clothing. And then I was mentioning earlier, when you're sleeping in a Quincy, so I built one with um, three guys in January. And 
they were going to go to sleep and they were going to wear like their big winter parka and their ski pants and they had sleeping bags too. And I was like, actually, like you guys want to take that off, (laughs) like take it all off, just wear a base layer, wear like a long sleeve thin shirt when you're sleeping, because when you wear too many layers, it you don't allow that little bit of space of air to get between you and that layer and that insulates you and keeps you warm, right? And so when you're in your sleeping bag, if you can have a thin base layer of merino wool is what I always recommend. Um, That's like a magic material from nature. And then your sleeping bag can reflect the heat back at you and keep you warm. But if you have too many layers on, that heat actually can't get in through your jacket. So you still also need a sleeping bag that will keep you warm too. You can't be out there in a plus 10 sleeping bag and minus 20. Um, But that's my other big tip is people think they need to overdress when they're sleeping. So those would be like my big two tips and they're not in the actual construction of the Quincy, but just in managing your temperature while you're constructing it. Yeah, that's that's really good advice. And that wouldn't just be for sleeping in the Quincy then, like thinking about the loft of your sleeping bag and keep and maintaining that. Um, but also if someone chose to sleep in a tent in the winter, for sure. The ground leaches so much heat out of you throughout the night. So I always recommend a mat or a thermo rest. And then in the winter time, you know those emergency blankets, you can get those silver crinkly ones. I managed to pick one up. It's a little bit thicker and it's a little bit bigger. Like it's probably when it's like um, wrapped up, it's probably, I don't know, maybe eight inches by six inches when it's like all folded together. So it's quite large, but it has a reflective surface on it. So I put that underneath everything and then put all my sleeping stuff on just to like help wrap myself up in as much heat. It's like a baked potato, right? If you can lay on top of that foil and reflect your heat, that's going to be a benefit as well. But yeah, you will leach out so much heat if you're just laying directly on the ground. It brings me back to some cold nights. This is great. I'm really, really learning a lot. <laughs> <laughs> but a few cold ones. <laughs> yeah. Ashlyn, what's your, what's your most memorable winter memory that you have in Saskatchewan, preferably? I think as a kid, one of the things that I really remember is we had snowmobiles and like we would go out and we would go to Toboggan Hill nearby our farm. We go tobogganing down the hill all day and you'd still be out when dark hit and you'd go home at night. And I was so little that I was actually like riding in front of my dad on the snowmobile, right? Because I didn't have my own. I wasn't old enough to drive anything. Um, So I think that was just some really cool memories I have of my family being out in the winter and enjoying it and realizing it doesn't have to be cold or miserable it's actually a lot of fun and I think looking to children in the snow all the time like they just have a blast they're rolling around like having a ball they're warm because they're dressed appropriately um so I think that's like a really fun childhood memory and then as like an adult getting into winter activities I think building the Quincy back in January was a cool experience because it was actually with wind chill it was minus 52 It's extreme temperatures. I was doing it for work, actually. And I had to email um, who I was like working with to be like, just like, just so you know, like, we're gonna go ahead with this. But like, it's quite cold. These are extreme conditions. So I don't know what's gonna happen. But that being said, like, we had backup plans. And the three guys I was out with, I told them in advance, I'm like, there's no pressure to do this, but they were all down for it. And we actually, in that temperature, we stood outside around the fire till 4 a.m. just hanging out and chatting. So if you're set up for it, like minus 52, we're standing around a fire and we're totally fine, but it's just being planned and prepared and then having backup plans and fast emergency backup plans. Because if something does go wrong in those extreme temperatures, you literally have minutes, right? Like the exposure to that kind of cold, it's, it's, it is really serious. So we had lots of different plans in place and lots of people knew where we were and everything too. So that's really an important side of being in the outdoors. You kind of, I know you've traveled all the world and things like that. What was there a part of traveling that kind of made you realize that there's something unique in Saskatchewan here? Or was that more when you, you got to explore more of Saskatchewan, you came back? I think it happened while I was traveling. You meet a lot of people. I remember I was in Bolivia and I was out traveling in the salt flats and you're at really high elevation. There's like no light pollution essentially out there. And the ability to see the stars is some of the most incredible 
I have night skies I have ever seen. And like, we have great dark sky preserves here in Saskatchewan and Canada too. And I was traveling with a bunch of international people and I remember their awe at seeing the stars. And then I was just thinking, I was like, oh, I could just walk outside my farm mm -hmm. and see amazing skies at night plus the Northern Lights. And so I think it was moments like that where you hear from other people what they're most amazed by. And then you can connect that back to your lived experiences to say, hey, that's different or similar to what I know. And so it was just kind of a constant thing as I traveled, always comparing it back to home and, and seeing the unique things that we do have here. You've mentioned before that Saskatchewan's is a great place, but during these times, that kind of limits some of the things that people can do. I think especially like with schools and things like that, they can't. Maybe with some families, why do you think Saskatchewan is still a great place to explore local? I think the fact that we have so much space here is the biggest thing that we have going for us. We're not a huge, our cities aren't huge in the way Toronto is, where it's hard to get out and there's so many people everywhere. And if everybody is getting out, they're crowding our, those nearby locations outside of Toronto. Um, so you can get out to nature here really easily and have those solo private moments where there's nobody else around or there's only a couple people and I was in Cypress Hills recently and I'm also very aware when I'm when I'm talking publicly about traveling but there's a travel mandate going on to be like limit where you're going limit what you're doing I take that seriously too right so to the point where we brought in most of our own food I did go out to a restaurant one evening that was kind of a work thing as well but we went with masks it was all socially distanced but then we brought our own food in with us so you're just limiting your exposure to not just other travelers but to the community that you're in and respecting that as well or I hope a lot more people take advantage of Saskatchewan and what we have to offer especially in the winter during these times because it'll be easy to feel cooped up if um, if we don't kind of build those hobbies outside and I'm I'm trying to get myself back into cross-country skiing and I say back into cross-country skiing because I used to do it as a kid but I haven't done much as an adult cross-country skiing feel... is that back swing with the arm I'm like you never do that in life you never like swing your arm that far back <laughs> sorry Ashley, you can try some workout <laughs> <laughs> Maybe I've been skiing wrong because I don't think I, so I think get that. Me. I think I'm like. <laughs> I always notice it because I transition from. I still do a lot of winter running, but transitioning from running to cross country skiing, I'm like, oh yeah, this is a great workout for my arms as well, and I miss that when I'm just running. <laughs> but I I do also agree. Like I even even through my social media and the groups that I manage, I've been seeing an uptick in questions from people about where to go to have a great local getaway and a cabin in particular. Everybody's looking for the great cabin getaways. And I've had so many people message me that they're like, oh, I haven't been cross country skiing in years, but I'm going to, I got skis and getting back into it or I'm renting skis. And so I think that's such a wonderful thing is to see how people are positively approaching something that can be very challenging. And I know not everybody can get outside, but it's been really awesome to see people looking at things from a different perspective than they, what they might normally do, right? We're, we're, Saskatchewan is a culture where we eat and drink inside a lot, especially in the winter time. So it's cool to see people going outdoors more now. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I guess I, I do have a few more questions about, about location. Uh, so I'm thinking if, if someone listening to this is thinking, I just, I want to get out, maybe I want to try building a Quincy for the first time, or I want to pitch a tent somewhere for the first time in the winter and see if I, if I make it through the night, not in minus 52, but a little bit warmer, where might people go? Where would you suggest in Saskatchewan? So there are a few places that I can recommend where I learned kind of my basic winter skills was Prince Albert National Park. Um, it's a really winter friendly location. And a few years ago, it was one of the few places that was open for seasons. And so they have woodcut, they have outdoor kitchens, some of them are completely enclosed. So you can build fires, you can stay warm. And there's also places that you can build Quincy's as two Quincy's as well. There's front country campgrounds, but then there's back country campgrounds too. But I don't want to just focus on a national park that everybody goes to because there's lots of locations in the province. Um, Blue Mountain Adventure Park, it's kind of near North Battleford, North Battleford, excuse me, is another really great location. They have amazing cross country ski trails. They have like a biathlon loop there. They have cabins that you can rent. But I know I called them up and I was like, hey, I actually want a winter camp. I don't want to stay in the cabin. And they have their campsites and they'll bring 
bring you wood as well. But they also have a lodge area. So if you are cold or you need to get out of the cold, you can get up at two in the morning and the lodge is always open for you to like stop in, warm yourself up, make a hot chocolate, whatever you need to do. So there are, there are more and more winter places that are open. And even Cyprus, where I just was, they're really pushing the winter activities. Again, there's cabins and townhouses, but they are opening up one of the camping loops for people who do want to try winter camping. And they're actually adding more enclosed shelters and warm up shacks on the ski and snowshoe trails too. So I'm definitely seeing like a wonderful push for encouraging four season adventures here. That's exciting. Cause yeah, we were talking about actually with one of our first guests on the show, Zev, just talking about like, there are so many cool places in Saskatchewan to go to, but we just often forget. And yeah, Prince Albert National Park is absolutely wonderful. I love it too, but there are lots of other great places too. Mm -hmm. So I like to rep them whenever I can. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I think we are ready to ask you the question that, <laughs> that we ask all of our guests and that you said you'd have to do some preparing for. If you could change one thing in the world, what would it be? So I am so incredibly privileged um, to be Canadian, to have access to the things I do, to have a golden ticket passport. And I sometimes can't even recognize my full privilege because like there's just so much of it. And with all of my global travels, I think the most powerful thing you can ever offer somebody is knowledge and education. And there are lots of places where people just don't have access. The full and supportive thing we could do for anybody is to be able to provide education because then you can give somebody the skills to do whatever it is that they want or need to do. So I would love to improve access to education around the world if I could or can help in any way. You're doing it right now, but you also have a degree to do it too, hey? Yes, and that's what I actually say is like, I'm not teaching in a classroom. I'm using my blog to teach and educate. And, and it might be to other people like me living in the same places as me. But I think that there's also a power in that education as well too, right? Like a lot of people forget what we have access to in our backyard. So I always think when I put something out, is it educating somebody? And how well can I research it to share new knowledge with others? Well, it's so great to have someone like you being being an advocate for Saskatchewan and for getting outdoors in Saskatchewan and, and really across the globe. We appreciate you taking the time to be with us for the last yeah. hour. That's awesome. Well, All no, right. I appreciate you guys reaching out and, uh, and asking me to be on the podcast too. So thank you very much. If we were to tell people where they can go to connect with you and learn more about you and your adventures, where can we send them? Yeah, so I'm on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. My hand is the lost girl's guide to finding the world i usually just shorten it to the lost girl's guide and then of course my website is the lost girls guide.com mike what was your big takeaway or your favorite part about our chat with ashley i think my favorite part was hearing her talk about how one opportunity kept leading to other ones so she would you know go visit a place in saskatchewan and then on top of that, you try to load up going to other places at the same time, visiting friends and family, and then working that into it was part of her job too, but kind of layering in all these experiences all at once. And I think her experience traveling internationally probably really helped her when she came back home in Saskatchewan, kind of get that feel for yeah, one thing can definitely just open doors to another experience. So I thought that was a really neat thing to hear her talk about and explain and um, kind of get a more local sense of what that's like. Yeah, absolutely. I loved hearing about the behind the scenes of her, um, of her like blog turned mostly Instagram con content and about the fact that she's a type A person. And I, I don't know, I just picture like adventurers and people who go across the world and are just like free souls, not as being type A people who plan out every financial choice. I feel like the way that she's done it, yeah, she gets to experience a lot. She gets to meet a lot of people and she gets to travel like a long ways in a short mm -hmm. amount of time because she's so meticulous in her planning. Yeah. And how the heck does she remember that much about each country and about these, these experiences? That's amazing. Yeah. And that's something I really have to work on because she was telling stories and I was thinking, I've been to Indonesia in Southeast Asia and I couldn't drop names like she's dropping mm -hmm. names. <laughs> yeah. Well, I imagine like is. writing, like a writing, maybe writing about it helps her, yeah. like, you know, making sure she takes those photos. But yeah, I'm the same boat. Like I, 
I remember food, like when she started talking about ice cream, I started like listing off all these places in my mind, like they had good ice cream. Oh yeah, Budapest, <laughs> that was good ice cream. <laughs> Slightly larger portions. Yeah, all about the food, hey? <laughs> yeah. um, did Ashley make you want to get out anywhere in Saskatchewan or like do something different in, in winter? Yeah, I think I, and it's even when I teach my class, I'm kind of like, I think the kids are always, Sometimes kids are like gung-ho and ready to go, but for the most part, they're a little more apprehensive to get out there in the winter. And I think I totally allow that and like kind of let that bleed, not bleed, uh, let that go into my teaching. Whereas I plan a lot of trips in the fall and the spring, but I don't plan a lot in the winter. It's kind of like this, we'll get through science. Yeah, like we'll get through chemistry. Yeah, we'll get through the classroom work, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. I don't know, how about with you? Um, Well, I... Even just hear her, hearing her say that she's bought skate skis when she's only done it once and she's just going to challenge herself to do that. And I'm like, holy smokes, that's wonderful. Like it's another reason for her to enjoy winter and another, yeah, another kind of fallback plan and great exercise and a great absolutely. way to get out. And it looks cooler than when you just regular cross country yes, ski. Yes, absolutely. Like, and then it's not as much as a, of a tricep workout that you're talking about. Right? <laughs> yeah. I think you get out of people's way when you see a skate skier coming <laughs> yeah. at you. <Yeah. laughs> true (laughs) but it takes time and practice and work Mm -hmm. to get to that level that people are going to get out your way right absolutely and I think that's what scares me but it seems to uh, just pump Ashlyn up yeah absolutely if you enjoyed this episode subscribe review on whatever you're listening to and don't forget to send to a friend who you think might be interested as always thanks for listening and take care